So first of all, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ashraf, for inviting me today to speak. I have a challenging uh, task ahead of me as I am the first speaker among a group of well-renowned clinicians and scientists in the field of uh, respiratory medicine. Actually, I was a bit taken aback when I saw I'm the only assistant professor among a list of, of professors. I also have a daunting task to be um, trying to summarize the latest updates on the immunology of COVID-19. And although this virus has only been with us for a little over than a year, it's claimed the lives of over 2 million people worldwide and infected over 100 million people. Um, so it's now more important than ever to really understand in depth the immune responses to this virus. So some of the things I would like to talk about today in my talk are the immune responses mounted in response to SARS-CoV-2 um, brush on a bit to the immune dysregulation associated with COVID-19. I'd like to present some novel data um, on the inborn errors of immunity that have been seen in COVID-19 patients, especially severe patients, um, and compare the immune responses in different severities and subgroups of COVID-19 patients. And I don't think I can speak about COVID-19 today in 2021 without slightly talking about vaccine and immune responses. And I know that Professor uh, Brian Ward will be uh, uh, talking about that, and he really is the expert in the field of, of vaccination. So I'll slightly brush upon it. So why is it important to understand the immune responses in COVID-19? Well, for various reasons. First, we are aiming to identify individuals with mild symptoms who may progress to a more severe form of the disease. And it's really important to understand the immune responses, um, to understand what type of response do we need to either activate or suppress to help those patients that are infected. And it will help us. I know that we already have developed vaccines, but it will help us in understanding these vaccines and, and, and improving the vaccines in terms of what type of immune response will be mounted um, to all these different types of vaccines that we have. So data on, on the immunology of COVID-19 ranges in all types of topics going from what type of immune response are we mounting? Is it humoral? Is it cellular? Is it only humoral? Is it only cellular? Um, what is the immune dysregulation that we see? Are we making antibodies? And how much antibodies are we making? And for how long are we making these antibodies? Why do certain individuals progress to a more severe outcome of COVID-19 and the relationship between the cytokine storm and the severe outcomes of COVID-19? And of course, the treatment. So the convalescent plasma therapy and, of course, the, the vaccines. So to understand SARS-CoV-2, we have to understand the um, typical immune response to an infection. So in terms of any pathogen or infection, the first immune response to be mounted is the innate immune response. And this response is the first line of defense. It's the first response to be activated. And the participants in this innate immune response are various cells like the neutrophils and macrophages and the dendritic cells. Following the activation of the innate immune response a few days later follows the activation of the adaptive immune response. And the players of this response um, are either part of the humoral or the cellular response. And those are the B lymphocytes, which are producing the antibodies and the T cells, uh, which are activating these B cells, and also the cytotoxic T cells, which are helping to clear and kill the infected cells. Following a time course of the infection, what's also important is the generation of memory. So the um, generation of either memory T cells or memory B cells, which are going to obviously become important in the event of reinfection. So if we look at a time course of an infection, we start at day zero with the, um, with the uh, infection. The first response to be activated is the innate immune response followed by the cellular immune response, which will then lead to the activation and the production of antibodies, starting with the IgM isotype here that we see in black, and then the IgG isotype. And over time, the virus will be cleared. But you'll notice that although the virus is being cleared, what remains um, uh, you know, increasing at a steady pace is the production of the IgG isotype of antibodies. So 
In terms of the SARS-CoV-2, this is a beta coronavirus, which contains viral genetic material, a protein shelf, which pro provides protection for the genetic material, an outer envelope, which allows it to merge with the uh, outer cells membrane, and protein spikes, which cover the, the, the surface. So droplets carrying the virus will travel from one person to another. They will enter the lungs of an individual. And once inside the lungs, they uh, will come into contact with cells of the nose or the lungs. The virus will bind to a specific receptor that we know today to be the ACE2 receptor. This will allow the entry of the, of the virus into, into the cell. It accesses the ribosomes to make the viral protein, such as the spike protein, um, and all the uh, necessary uh, proteins. They are carried to the vesicle, and they are going to merge with the cell membrane, and you're going to get a budding of uh, new viruses. Now, the immune system is equipped to, the body is equipped to mount an immune response to these, to these viruses. However, what occurs sometimes is an overactivation of the immune response and an overwhelming of the immune response, which leads to potentially inflammation, um, of course, inflammation or hyperinflammation, and sometimes the severe outcomes of COVID-19, such as pneumonia. Sorry. So the virus, as I said, binds to an ACE2 receptor, specifically it binds through the spike protein. Through a cascade of events, you get a, a release of the virus replication and release of the virus. This is going to be uptaken by antigen presenting cells, which are part of the innate immune response. This will then activate the T helper cells, which are going to then activate B cells to allow the production of antibodies or potentially also activate the cytotoxic T cells, which are these killer T lymphocytes, which are important in the destruction of infected cells. So what we really know is that there is an importance for all the players of the immune response to be uh, present to really fight this infection. So ranging from NK cells to macrophages to neutrophils to T cells and B cells. And actually a recent study, and obviously all studies that are uh, related to COVID are, are recent studies, has shown that all arms of the adaptive immune response are really necessary to be able to mount an effective immune response. So we're talking about the T helper um, cells, the cytotoxic T cells, and the antibody production. And with age, there seems to be a dysregulation in the coordination of, of these three arms of the adaptive immune response, and that's associated with a more severe outcome of COVID-19. Now, this immune response is meant to be a protective response, but in certain individuals, we see that it becomes pathogenic. And this is where we see a increase in these pro-inflammatory cytokines to a very high degree. So cytokines such as IL-1 and IL-6 and TNF-alpha, and this is uh, termed the cytokine storm. The cytokine storm will lead to multi-organ dysfunction. So we know that it will affect not only the lungs, but the GI tract, to the brain, the liver, the kidneys, and um, hence the, the appearance of all of these symptoms that we are seeing in COVID-19 patients and potentially death. So in the early studies on COVID-19, they attempted to look at the differences between survivors and non-survivors of COVID-19 and looking at mediators of the innate immune response, such as IL-6. And what they found was that in, in non-survivors of COVID-19, there seems to be a huge um, uh, increase in the levels of IL-6 compared to the survivors. But then when you look at um, mediators of the adaptive immune response, such as the lymph lymphocyte count, what they found was actually in the non-survivors, there was a lymphopenia um, which persisted and this lymphopenia actually improved in survivors. We now know today that um, COVID-19 also affects males and females in a different fashion. Um, so worldwide, the case, um, the fatality rate is much higher in, in males compared to females. And this is true in all age groups. 
various mechanisms have been um, put out there to kind of explain this, uh, this dysregulation in, in, in males compared to females, ranging from the virus entry to virus sensing to dysregulations in the innate and adaptive immune responses. Whatever the mechanism is, what we see is a prolonged SARS-CoV-2 shedding sometimes in males compared to females, and definitely an increased risk of developing lower respiratory tract infections and um, uh, secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines or the cytokine storm as we as we explained. So there's obviously a genetic, it seems to be that there's an, a genetic predisposition to developing more severe COVID-19. And this nice study looked at um, a major genetic risk factor for se severe COVID-19, which is inherited from the Neanderthal. So the study identified a gene cluster at chromosome three containing six genes as a risk locus for respiratory failure following uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. And this genetic segment of about 50 kilo bases uh, is, that is inherited from Neanderthal is carried by 50% of people in South Asia and only 16% of people in Europe. Another group of researchers, um, a huge consortium named the COVID Human Genetic Effort, led by the, uh, by the famous Dr. Jean-Laurent Casanova. Um, and this group is really, um, they are experts in the field of inborn errors of immunity, published two papers back to back in uh, late September in science, showing in one part that, um, and so they were comparing severe COVID-19 patients to more mild or uh, asymptomatic patients. And they found that there were inborn errors of type one interferon immunity in one study. And in the other study, they found that there was a significant number of these severe COVID-19 patients, which made these autoantibodies against type one interferons compared to 0% of the mild uh, or asymptomatic uh, COVID-19 patients. So it's great knowing all of this, that all of these immune responses are mounted. But I guess the question of the day is, can the human uh, immune system mount a lasting defense against the SARS-CoV-2? So what we do know today is that most COVID-19 patients have detectable levels of antibodies. The antibodies seem to develop one to three weeks after the symptoms first appear. The patients with severe diseases have uh, higher levels of neutralizing antibody. And there's a lot of data out there looking at the, um, the timeline of how long these uh, neutralizing antibodies are present. And, you know, I tried to kind of summarize it here just to show that studies are showed that the neutralizing antibodies can range from anywhere from one to eight months after production. So these antibodies against what are they made? So we said that the SARS-CoV-2 contains these spike proteins on the surface. Um, and within the spike protein, there is a specific domain called the receptor binding domain over here, RBD. And Studies have shown that the receptor binding domain is immunodominant and is the target of about 90% of the neutralizing activity present in SARS-CoV-2 immune sera. And a specific study showed that although the um, RBD-specific serum IgG titers have a half-life of 49 days, the neutralizing antibody titers and their avidity actually increases over time for some individuals consistent with affinity maturation. And knowing that, obviously, some individuals have tried to see, can we use these antibodies as therapy? So this study looked at taking convalescent plasma um, uh, and uh, you know, giving it to, to COVID-19 patients. And they found that if we look at the survival probability over time, that individuals that received the convalescent uh, plasma um, fared a lot better than the individual, their matched controls. And obviously an ideal vaccine would induce enough sterilizing immunity through antibody production and confer long lasting immunity. Also, um, a few months ago, when former President Donald Trump um, got COVID-19, this um, therapy uh, developed by Regeneron uh, was put, uh, you know, out there. And um, this, this therapy uses the, a cocktail of monoclonal antibodies where the target region is the receptor binding domain. 
And the source of the antibodies is B cells harvested from previously infected patients or genetically humanized mouse uh, that, that produce optimized um, uh, fully human antibodies. A few days ago, there was a, um, I don't know if you could call it a press release or, or whatnot, that suggested that this, this cocktail uh, of monoclonal antibodies could actually be used as a passive vaccine, which would confer immediate passive immunity. Um, so they are looking at thousands of patients, but um, this, this study was just um, on a small scale of those thousands of patients. And they were saying that there could be potential for using this not only as therapy for individuals who have have COVID-19, but also um, as, a, as a passive um, immunization. So what do the presence of antibodies really mean that you are protected against reinfection? And even today, I could say that we don't exactly have the clear answer to that. But what we do know is that definitely, like we said, it's not sufficient to just make antibodies. The all of the arms of the adaptive immune system need to be in play to get a proper um, response. So that brings us to the question of the, the T cells. So we know that T cell immune responses are sustained even in the face of declining or undetectable levels of antibodies. And studies from SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV have found that there are T cell responses even years after infection. And a very recent study a few weeks ago showed that um, there is T cell immunity against SARS-CoV-2 in most patients who were SARS-CoV-2 positive, um, but that have undetectable, undetectable IgG antibodies against the S1 protein. Another study showed that um, in individuals that have been infected with the SARS-CoV-2, that 100% of the patients had a, a SARS-CoV-2 reactive CD4 positive T cells, which correlated with the levels of the antibodies. And about 70% of the uh, patients had um, uh, CD8 positive uh, responses. Now, interestingly, they also looked at a cohort of patients who were unexposed to COVID-19, and they found that 50%, a range between 40 to 60% of these individuals had SARS-CoV-2 reactive CD4 positive T cells uh, against specific uh, parts of the, of the virus. And I'm sorry, I can't see the number here. And there was a small percentage um, that had um, CD8 positive T cell res responses, suggesting a cross-reactive T cell recognition between circulating common cold coronaviruses and the SARS-CoV-2. So how long do COVID-19 vaccines confer immunity? I mean, I guess there really isn't, again, a clear answer to that. But knowing that there are responses that are long lasting in the event of inf infection, we would hope that the vaccines could also provide a long lasting uh, response um, following the vaccination. And like I said, I'm sure that uh, Professor Brian Ward will be answering this question or attempting at least to answer this question in, in his talk in a few hours from, from now. So in summary, what we do know today is that both innate and adaptive immune responses to SARS-CoV-2 are mounted. And these responses are meant to be protective responses, but they can become pathological in, in, in certain individuals. Definitely the immune responses differ in different subgroups of patients. Uh, in certain individuals, the cytokine, cytokine storm really plays a major role in the severe outcomes of COVID-19. There is the presence of neutralizing antibodies, which do confer protection, but really in reality, all arms of the adaptive immune response are important to mount a, um, a effective uh, response against SARS-CoV-2. Now, the question of duration of immunity, whether it be due to infection or vaccination to SARS-CoV-2 definitely remains unknown. Um, and I guess that only time can really tell. Um, so with that, I thank you all for your attention and again, for inviting me to, to be a speaker today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Asaba, for outstanding uh, talk. Uh, I couldn't resist trying to summarize these points because it was very educational 
for myself personally. And I'd like to uh, summarize, and uh, you play the teacher now, correct me if I say something because I'm I'm not sure you'll get it all right. <laughs> so you mentioned that the immune uh, response is supposed to be protective, but sometimes mm -hmm. it can be destructive or pathogenic, uh, yeah. pathogenetic maybe the right word. And you also mentioned that non-survivors were noticed to have more lymphopenia and higher levels of interleukin-6. Um, and you also mentioned that males tend to do worse and we don't know uh, why that is, but they tended to have more lower respiratory tract infection and higher cyto cytokine storms than females. And uh, you alluded into the genetic, and you mentioned that South Asian, Asian were more uh, at risk, uh, uh, sorry, m had more of this chromosome three, 50% of them, uh, while 16% of European had the chromosome uh, three genetic um, a predisposition. Is this chromosome supposed to be protective or pathogenic? Pathogenic. So they say that if you inherit that, you have higher increase of developing respiratory failure. Um, so yeah, it's pathogenic in this case. So it's, and it's only one- There's a higher mortality in South mm -hmm. Asia. Mm -hmm. South yes, Asia. that could be explained by this, but this is only one factor and so many other factors are at play here, but yes. Okay, and uh, you also mentioned about the autoantibodies being mm -hmm. found for uh, interferon uh, in people with yeah. more severe disease. Yes. Sustained, you, said, you mentioned there is sustained immunity. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if we cannot detect the antibody, the IgG level. Yes. I want to tell us in simple words, beside the IgG, what other immunity parameter uh, uh, biomarkers can scientists look for beside the IgG? Mm -hmm. Because this is available now, IgG. Yeah. Uh, so that's the first question. What other uh, immune uh, biomarkers can we look for? Number two, mm -hmm. if that is the case, if there is sustained immunity, why are people getting reinfected again? Okay, so to answer your first question, yes. So um, just to summarize, yes. Uh, so certain, uh, when the levels of IgG are decreased, that does not mean that you are not protected anymore because there is the other arm of the adaptive immune response, which is very important. And actually to make antibodies, you need that cellular arm. So the T cells are the, the cells that are responsible in the activation of the B cells to allow them to produce antibodies. Um, so in this specific study that I mentioned, where they're looking at the percentage of, of reactive CD4 positive T cells and reactive CD8 positive T cells, that is something that can be done to look at the CD4, specifically the CD4 positive T cells reactivity against the SARS-CoV-2. And you can do that in, in, in the laboratory. It's, it's something that is, that is commonly done. Or look at the um, reactivity of the CD8 positive T cells towards, uh, towards SARS-CoV-2. Um, and this, this immunity is really important because it is the immunity that will allow you to sustain um, and without it, you cannot make antibodies. That, that's really the, 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 the take home message is that we, we all are concentrating on the antibody response because when we look at vaccination, that's the hallmark of how much antibody did I make, but that is not the only marker that we should be looking at. Um, and I so think your second you question was, can you just repeat your second question? Yeah, yeah. How, why are we getting reinfected if we still have antibodies? So, I mean, I don't actually know what the data is on reinfection. Um, I would have to go back and look at that because I, I, you know, I don't know what is the percentage. I mean, maybe you know the answer to this. What is the percentage of individuals that are actually getting reinfected? Um, I don't know if there is really any data out there to really show that there is a high chance of, of, of developing, um, of developing, of re, re, getting reinfected with SARS-CoV-2. I agree with you that the, that the data on reinfection after a COVID infection itself is not yeah. as, as the data yeah. from clinical for those who got the vaccine. Those who got the vaccine, 
uh, at least from the UAE experience, uh, the officials have suggested that the vaccine was protective in 86% of the people who yes. got the vaccine. 14% still got infected again. Mm -hmm. However, the vaccine was not a severe disease. And yes. I'm just wondering, uh, what we noticed that we have colleagues uh, or patients who got reinfected and their antibody is still positive. Mm -hmm. We have antibody level on them, yet they got disease. It's not severe disease, but it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Why are we getting reinfected again? If I, I have mean, it's also each, I think the, the, the thing that we also have to understand is that our immune responses are like our fingerprints, you know? each individual has a different immune response and and it does not follow a linear trend i think that, that that's that's also something that we have to remember um but i i, I why certain individuals maybe the titer of the antibody is not sufficient to be protective it's not enough just to say i ha i make antibodies it depends on the titer of antibodies that that you're making and they should be quite high to be to prevent you from from reinfection so there was a study that also looked at the titers. They looked at like something like 30,000 uh, patients of COVID-19 and looked at the titers of antibodies. Most people, I'd say 50% make large titers of, of antibody, but there is a significant percentage which make very small titers of the neutralizing antibody to SARS-CoV-2. Thank you. The last question, tell us yeah. about the mutation what do you think about the virus and mutation and this new strain from the immunological standpoint what would you say yeah is? so i mean i think the important question is also i think the question that is on, is on everybody's mind as we enter this new era of vaccination as you said we're you know i i see the light at the end of the tunnel i hope anyways um in terms of vaccination is that do these vaccines work against these new variants um, the data is still slowly coming out, um, but I think that it's promising that in terms of the, um, of, of the common vac vaccines that we're using now, that they seem to be uh, effective, maybe not to that level that we initially saw, like 90% and over, but they seem to be effective against the, the new variants. Um, and, and I think the other thing is that it's still too it's still too early to really say what the immune response is to these new variants. I mean, it took us a year to get to where we are today in terms of the knowledge of the immune responses to the to SARS-CoV-2. It will take a while to know what how the immune response is is being mounted to these new variants of the virus. You agree with your last statement. It's amazing how much we learned over the last year about this new yeah. disease. I think yes. the technology is helping a lot uh, with our knowledge and with the uh, de development of those vaccines and other yes. things. That yes, definitely. There's something new coming out every day. I mean, it's so it's so difficult to keep up because literally every day you have and these huge studies. They're not you know little little studies that you can kind of bypass. Um, lots of lots of data is being is being generated from from this uh, from this COVID nineteen pandemic, and it's really interesting. Um, to see that so much focus is on immunology and, and understanding the immune responses because it will help us in other diseases also to understand what kind of immune responses are being mounted. Dr. Saba, thank you very much. Uh, thank I you so much, Dr. Asha. I'm sure my colleagues enjoyed it too. And it's thank you so much. to have you in the platform. Likewise, thank you so much for having me today. Thank you so much, bye-bye.